Thank you all for coming to my talk. My name is Boris. And yeah, I am a founder and a software designer at Code Synthesis, where we try to make some interesting tools and libraries for C++. And the topic of today's presentation is ODB, which is an open source cross-platform and cross-database object relational mapping system for C++. The topic is actually as has two parts. The first part, which is now we basically have an introduction and cover basic operations, while the second half, which is right after this one, is, um, is about advanced techniques and mechanisms that are often necessary when the whole ORM idea falls apart. So what's an ORM anyway? It's actually a good question, and the term is, has become pretty useless these days because people call ORM anything ranging from massive frameworks that cover the relational nature of the database completely, such as Hibernate, for example, for Java. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, a thin wrappers over SQL, and they call themselves ORMs as well. So, but. So why would we use an ORM? Well, there are several good reasons. Uh, I'm sure you've heard the term uh, object relational impedance mismatch. Basically, the idea is that in, in C++, you are dealing with objects, with classes and data members, while the database deals in terms of tables, columns, and so on. Then there is type, type and name safety. If you are using plain SQL to access the data in the database, you are spelling it out as strings. As a result, and you pass your data as strings as well, or in some binary form, depending on the API. So the problem with this is that the database will only be able to detect type and name mismatches at runtime. Then there's parameter binding and result set extraction. I'm sure those of you had the privilege of accessing a database using some low-level SQL API, I can say this is not fun. Then there's database schema evolution. I like to think of it as dentistry. You know, we don't like to, to, to talk or think much about it, but without it, life will actually become pretty bleak. So if we have to, if we have to write a piece of SQL like that every time we add, for example, a data member to, to our class, then you, know, you will start thinking twice, do you want to, to make this change? And so it's not fun. We'll see later some more examples of that. Why wouldn't we want to use an RM? That's also a good question. In fact, ORMs have been getting quite a bit of flack lately, and there are some good reasons for that. ORMs often hide too much. You know, you, you might have an innocently looking call in your C++ application, which translates to thousands of underlying database statement executions, which affects performance. So it's easy to shoot yourself in the foot. ORMs are often also what we call frameworks. You know, they, they assume that your application is going to build around the way things, the, the, the author of the framework thought how things should be done. And then, of course, it's always fun to roll your own ORM, right? It's only half of it. So that's a signature from the Oracle uh, OCI API. So sometimes it's fun, sometimes not so much. So if, if ORMs are not, you know, we, we choose a relational database and then we need something else to make it work for us, why would we choose a relational database in the first place? And that's a good question. And the answer is there's not really many, there aren't really many alternatives if the data that you store is important to you. Uh, relational databases are mature and reliable. There is also tooling support and alternatives. So if, if, you know, if your favorite database 
gets acquired by an evil corporation, at least there are some options. Relational model is also fairly flexible. It's not that difficult to map, say, a class to a table, uh, especially if you compare it to mapping, for example, a class to a key value store. So if, if, if the data that you store is important to your relational databases are at the, at the moment pretty much the only choice. There are some alternatives such as document databases like a MongoDB or RethinkDB, but they are not uh, mature yet. So what's, what's ODB then? Well, ODB is an object relational mapping system, and the next natural question to ask is what kind of it is? What level is it? Com does it completely hide everything, or is it a low-level SQL wrapper? Well, I like to think of ODB as working on three levels. At the highest level, it hides the relational database completely, and you can just you know, store an, an object in a database. So you, in a sense, you get an object-oriented database. Then when this, and, and hopefully most of your code will be written in, in, at, at that level, then sometimes things uh, don't quite work out in the pure object-oriented way. And in this case, you can step down a level. You, you're still working with classes. It's, it's a little bit less pure object-oriented but you, you are not dealing with SQL or queries and stuff like that. We'll see some examples of that. Finally, for some really low-level database-specific work, you can actually go way down and write native SQL queries, and all ODB will do is provide support for result set extraction and parameter binding. ODB is not a framework. It doesn't dictate how you should write your application. In particular, there is no special base class that you have to derive from or special data members. The other um, thing that we try to avoid in ODB is, is magic. In particular, we try to stick to one-to-one -one ORM to database operation mappings, and I think we manage to do it in most places. In, a, in, in a certain places, it's not exactly um, possible. And, I'll, and in the, for those cases, those cases are clearly identified. There are warnings in the documentation. And there are also mechanisms for dealing with that. We'll see quite a bit of examples of that kind in the second half of the talk. OK, so what are the you know, game-changing main features of ODB? The most important difference between ODB and other ORMs for C++ that are available is automatic generation of database mapping code from your class declarations. You don't need to write any mapping or registration code for a class or a data member. There are no macros. This, the, another important feature of ODB is the ability to target multiple databases. This ranges from um, having a few specific ones selected and using their static interfaces to dynamically loading the database support code in the executable, and executable actually not, know, not even knowing which database it's working with. Finally, this the database schema evolution. Uh, this is actually, most ORMs, they don't provide much support for that, or they kind of say, okay, well, you can execute an alter statement yourself. But ODB, we, we try to provide a fairly comprehensive support for this. And we will cover some of it at the end of, of this half and some more at the, at the beginning of the next half. OK, when it comes to C++, ODB supports both 98 and 11. When it comes to C++ 11, it uses R value references. There is support for range-based for loops. We'll see some examples of that. It uses, it allows you to use lambdas and integrates with the C++, with, the addition, with C++ 11 additions to the standard library. And I'll use quite a bit of C++ 11 in examples in this in the next half of the talk. That makes code nice and clean, as we will see. As I mentioned, ODB is also cross-database. Currently, it supports these five databases. 
It's also cross-platform. You can use it on Linux, Windows, Mac OS X, Solaris. And co compiler-wise, you can use GCC, Visual C++, Clang, even Sun Studio. Anyone here had the pleasure of using Sun Studio? I see some people laughing. Well, if you can, you know, if you can, if you can compile a project with Sun Studio, then you, you know you can compile it with your mother's toaster, probably. <laughs> okay, who knows what that is? Right, that's that's a Raspberry Pi. It's a little embedded uh, Linux uh, computer, and ODB runs on that as well. Turned out that. ODB and SQL Lite is quite a popular combo for uh, mobile and embedded systems. Just to give you an idea, a statically linked hello world example with query support. And by statically, I mean everything. SQL Lite itself, ODB runtimes, and application code is about 500 kilobytes. The tool chain is cross compiler friendly and there are guides for Android and Raspberry Pi. We also mentioned some performance uh, numbers and some uh, idea about performance. ODB was, was designed from grounds up for uh, high performance in mind. It uses prepared statements throughout, and it caches connections, statements, and even memory buffers. When it comes to the database access, it uses low-level um, low level C APIs, so there are no wrapper overhead, so you saw that OCI function signature, so we have the ODBS to deal with that stuff. Finally, there is zero uh, per object memory overhead. In other words, your persistent classes, they don't have any special members that, that take up extra space. In fact, a funny thing is some users write and say, look, we compared ODB and, and, we, and our handwritten code that goes direct, directly to the API and the ODB is actually faster, and why is that? So it's quite a funny question to get. To, to, to get. I don't know why your code is slower than ODB. Just to give you some ideas about performance numbers, this is what it takes to load uh, an object with about half a dozen members. You can see a scale light being an embedded database is, is quite fast. License. ODB is dual licensed under the GPL and a commercial license. In particular, this means if you are using ODB based application in your within, only within your organization, for example, you run it on your company's service, then you don't need to really worry about any of the GPL restrictions. We also realize that this is not a particularly, neither of these two options are particularly suitable to other open source projects that might have a more liberal licenses, such as BSD. For such cases, we'll grant a licensing exception to any open source project that, that is interested in using ODB. And we've done it a couple of times already, and that works fairly easy. You can read about all this on the ODB licensing page in more detail. OK, so how does... Um, I mentioned that ODB generates the database mapping code automatically from our class declarations. So how does it do that? Well, these days, you don't really surprise anyone by being able to parse C++. There's Clang, and then there's the, there are GCC plugins. ODB underneath is implemented as a GCC plugin. The nice thing about GCC is that it's fairly mature. It's very portable, and it's readily available. It's hard to find a platform these days that doesn't have GCC on it. It's also one of the most complete C++11 implementations, so that's a nice bonus. The idea of, OD, of the ODB compiler is that you give it standard C++, your class declarations, and it, it generates C++, standard C++ as, a, as an output. As a result, you can use pretty much any C++ compiler to build your application. So you don't have, you don't have, just because you're using ODB, you don't have to use GCC as well. Even Sun Studio. And this turned out to be a really difficult po point to get across. Tomorrow I'm going to get an email from someone asking me, 
if they, if they have to use a GCC because they're using ODB. So just to repeat, standard C++ in, standard C++ out. Can use any compiler to compile the output. Okay, let's uh, see some code, shall we? So we can try to write a little bug tracker. There, there aren't enough out there already, so we'll create our own. So fairly standard stuff. We have a bug ID, status, summary, and a description. Let's see what it takes to turn this into a persistent class that we can store in the database. Okay, the first thing is we actually tell ODB that this class is persistent so that it knows that it needs to generate database mapping code for it. Next thing is this friend declaration. You can see all our data members are private. So this um, declaration grants ODB generated code access to these data members. We also add the default constructor. Strictly speaking, you don't have to, but it makes working with persistent objects easier. Then we mark the bug ID as an, as an object ID. Again, in, in ODB, you can have persistent classes that, are, that don't have an object ID. Well, for the, most of you are probably familiar with the relational databases. So underneath it's mapped to a primary key. So in ODB, you can have a class that is mapped to a table that doesn't have a primary key if you want to. We also uh, say that it's an automatically assigned object ID, which means that the database will assign it's a unique value for it, for us. So we don't need to worry about that. So these are all the changes. Quite a bit of stuff. Okay. Normally when you have private data members, you will also have accesses and modifiers to work with them. In this case, ODB will be able to automatically discover and use them in, your, in the generated code. So we can get rid of that friend declaration. ODB knows how to you know, it, 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 it has built-in knowledge about quite a few naming conventions. You can see we use get and, and a little bit different spelling. Doesn't know about this one, but what you can do is you can provide a regular expression that will pick it up. So you can add a custom naming convention for accesses and modifiers. Now, some of you might not like the idea of, you know, peppering your beautifully crafted classes with those pragmas. So in fact, you don't have to, you can move them into a separate block out of the class. You can even move them to a separate header file. So th this is an example. This shows that you can actually convert an existing C++ class to a ODB persistent class without any modifications to the class itself or, or its header file. Let's now take a look at the build workflow once we start using ODB. Here's a typical C++ application. We have a header file, we have a source file, and the source, source file includes the header file, and then it's compiled by some C++ compiler to build the final executable. Once we add, once we start using ODB, we compile the header file that, that declares our classes, persistent classes with the ODB compiler. The output of the ODB compiler set of C++ source and header files. You can also ask the ODB compiler to generate a database schema for us, basically the tables for, for storing our classes. We'll talk about that in a bit. The C++, the application source code includes the generated header file in order, in order to get access to the database mapping code. Finally, the generated source code is compiled along with the application source code to form the final executable. Okay. Right, let's take a look at some invocations of the ODB compiler. Here we are generating database, database mapping code for the Postgres. If we take a look what, what gets generated, you will notice this bunch of dash ODB files. These are the, this is the database mapping code. Some examples, some more examples. In a sense, ODB is a real C++ compiler in that, that 
you know, the input is, is C++. As a result, it supports the standard options, for, exa for example, dash I and dash D. Is another example here, we enable the C++11 mode and also make the standard shared pointer the default object pointer. We'll talk about object pointers in a bit. You can also add this generate schema option. And if we now look what gets generated, we'll notice there is, a, there is this bug.sql file. And if we take a look what's inside, then we'll see a table like that, which looks like it could store our bugs in MySQL. So we have, um, we have a, our persistent class and then we generated the database mapping code. What else do we need? Well, the other thing that we need is some notion of a database in our application. In other words, the representation of the database to which we are connecting. So here's how, how we can create one for Postgres. So we pass a user and password and a database name. Or for SQLite, we just pass the database file name. Normally, you wouldn't use this, in, this um, interfaces directly and rather would use the common interface in your code. This has several benefits. First of all, you will be able to switch from one database to another. If tomorrow you decide, you know, I don't want to use MySQL anymore, I want to use Postgres, then it will make your life easier. And this is also how we support multiple databases. We'll see that in a moment. Okay, let's talk about schema a bit. There are two options generally. You can either automatically generate it or you can write your custom schema or maybe you already have a schema. In case of a generated schema, there are two options. We can have it as a standalone SQL file. We saw it earlier in that bug.sql. Or we can embed it into the generated C++ code so that you can create the schema programmatically from within your application when and if necessary. This is how we would do that. So there's the schema catalog object and it has the create schema function. If, if, we, if we already have a schema, we prefer to write it ourselves. And ODB allows us to map uh, classes to tables and data members to columns and we can also specify custom SQL types for our data members. So let's take a look at that. Let's say we already have this, um, we have a database for our bugs and the table is called bugs and you know the column names are named a little bit different and instead of using an enum, we, we use a small int instead. So this shows how we can map all this to our C++ class. So with ODB you can, e you can either not worry about schema whatsoever and let it generate everything that's necessary or you can have a custom schema and map your classes to this schema. Okay, so I think we are ready to file our first bug report. So I think that's pretty easy. Create a bug, call persist. Let's talk about this transaction thing. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the notion of transactions. In ODB, all database changes are transactional. They are made within transaction. And transactions have these nice properties. The acronym for that is ACID. I'm sure most of you are familiar about that, with that, but let me just recap. So ACID stands, uh, A in the ACID stands for atomic. Transaction is a, is a single unit of change. It's either all succeeds or nothing at all. So for example, if, if this persist function, uh, this persist call fails, then the changes made by the first persist will be reverted. The transactions are also consistent, which means that each transaction changes the database from, from, one, consist, from one valid state to the next valid state. Transactions are also isolated. It means that if several transactions are running in parallel, they don't see partial changes of each other. And finally, they are durable, which means that once a transaction is committed, the changes are permanent. For example, if our application crashes immediately after this commit function returns, then the changes that we've made just a few calls before, they're actually permanent, they're stored in the database. So if, for example, our application restarts 
it will be able to see those objects stored in the database. Okay, so these are transactions back to our uh, persist call. Nothing really tricky here, passing the object, getting the object ID as a convenience in return. It's often useful to be able to see what is, what is actually executed underneath so that you know we know it's not a thousand database statements and we are not shooting ourselves in the foot. ODB allows us to trace um, to trace database statement execution on transaction level, connection level, and the database level. So here's how we can enable tracing for just for this transaction. Once we do that, this is what we will see. I think pretty looks should be something that you would expect. Insert all the values. You can see we are actually using prepared statements here and using returning to get the ID back that was assigned by the database. Okay, so if we have an ID, you see we got the ID here. So if we have the ID, then we can use the load function to load the bug from the database. This is how we would do that. And the alternative, so we can see we get, we, are, we get the dynamically allocated object. This is another way to do it. We can pass an instance to the load function instead. Remember I told you that the default constructor is actually not strictly necessary. Well, if you don't have one, this is, the, this is how you will have to load your objects. In other ways, you will have to construct it yourself somehow. Again, if we enable statement tracing on this transaction, then that's what we will see. Updating the state of, a, of an object in the database is also easy. So here's a simple transaction. We'll load the bug report, change the status to confirmed, and call update. Nothing really tricky. Again, this is the statement un executed underneath. Okay, querying the database for some objects. If we don't have an ID for an object, then we can use queries to find an object or some objects that match a certain criteria. When it comes to queries, there are two additional types that are involved. It's the query and the result. Queries basically represents the condition that we, that we want the objects to, to match. And the result is a container-like result object, which, which, has a, which supports forward iteration. And this is how we can iterate over it, or in C++11, much nicer way to do it. We use the range-based form. Okay, let's see how we can find, can load all the objects that, that are, uh, all the open bug reports in our database. This is how we can do that. You might notice that we use this status member to create the condition. The idea is that this query type it has data members corresponding to the data members in our persistent class, that which we can use to form a query condition. So in this case, we say, find us all the bugs that are open. And this is how we can iterate over it. That, we, that part we have seen already. In C++11, we can actually streamline this thing and get rid of that result all, the, uh, all together and do the querying inside the range-based for loop. So this is a nice and clean way to do it. And that's the statement that is executed underneath. Let's take a look at some more interesting examples of queries. We can use logical operators to combine several conditions to form more complex ones. So for example, now we are looking for open or confirmed bugs. We can also use by reference parameter binding. By default, all the parameters are bound by value, but if we want to execute the query several times that we can bind uh, some variable as a parameter and then initialize it to different values and execute the query. This is an example of a native query. Essentially, you can write your completely custom uh, where clause for, a, for the scale select statement. And ODB provides you a way to bind parameters conveniently, so you don't need to actually convert your stuff to strings. The last line shows the dangers of um, native queries. Remember I told you about 
uh, name and type safety. So this is a good example. When we use native queries, it's easy to misspell stuff or compare incompatible values. And such errors will only be detected at runtime when this stuff is actually executed. Okay, the last operation that we haven't covered is deleting persistent objects from the database. We can pass an ID or we can pass an object itself, in which case it j the ODB code just extracts the ID and deletes it by ID. Or we can use a query condition to delete a whole bunch of objects. So for example, we can delete all the closed bug reports in our database. Again, the SQL statement executed underneath for the first two cases. I think nothing surprising here, right? Okay, so, so far our class is fairly basic and the first thing that we would probably want to add is some kind of timestamps, you know, when it was created and when it was modified. So what, what can be used to represent a timestamp? Well, there's nothing in the standard yet, unfortunately. How about a boost? Well, there's boost daytime library, so maybe we can use that. So we can add the data members, but the question is, will it just work? And the answer is it pretty much will. We just need to talk briefly about profiles. ODB profiles are a generic mechanism for integrating ODB with popular third-party frameworks and libraries. Essentially, a profile is a glue code that allows us to seamlessly persist value types, containers, and smart pointers from these frameworks and libraries in our, from our persistent classes. ODB has built-in, um, it, it includes uh, profiles for Boost and Qt. You can also write your own profile. So for example, if you're in your company, you imp implemented your own STL, then you can write a profile for it. and It will just work just like a standard STL. To enable a profile, we use the dash P option. So for example, here we have uh, enabled the boost profile and the cute profile. So going back to our question, will it just work? Well, it will, as long as we specify this dash P boost option, which enables the boost profile, which contains the code necessary to persist, to map and persist these timestamps to the database. I'm gonna talk about smart pointers and containers late, later when we cover that. So now I'll just focus on value types. So when, when it comes to the boost profile, the, the value types that are handled automatically by it is the unique identifier. So we can just use that type in our persistent class and it will just work, no special action required. Then there are date time types and it is optional. What do you think is optional map to in the database? Any idea? No. no. Well, optional is basically either a value or nothing, right? So what would be an equivalent in a relational database? Well, it's a null, null, null column, right? So by default, an optional boost optional is mapped to a column basically with a null semantics. When it comes to the cute profile, again, basic types, string, unique identifier, byte array. So you can use byte array to store blobs and daytime types. So pretty standard stuff. So for those interested in Qt, here's the Qt version of our class. So we use Qt strings and daytime types. Again, this will work if we just enable the Qt profile. Okay, moving on. So far we've used simple types that map to columns in our class and but sooner or later we'll want to persist something more interesting like a container. ODB has built-in support for standard containers such as vector, list, set, map, and so on. So you just use those and it, it just works. When it comes to C++11, we get arrays and unordered containers. And the boost profile covers unordered versions of from boost as well as the multi-index container. This one is quite cool, I don't know, for those who are familiar. It's quite a tricky way to map it, but it works quite nicely. Then we have this cute containers, again, pretty much the standard one, 
ones. It's also easy to support your own container. So you can add support for your custom container and it will work just like any of the other ones. So as an example, let's add a list of comments to our bug report and also a set of tags. Again, we just add the containers and magically they are stored in the database. This is the cute version. Let me know if I'm going too fast, okay? Just trying to fit. Another kind of data member that we will want to use sooner or later is what we call a composite uh, or multi-column value type. It's basically a class or a struct that maps to multiple columns in the database. A composite value can contain other composite values, also can derive from composite values. It can contain containers and pointers to objects. We'll talk about pointers to objects a bit later. It can also be used as an object ID, so we end up with a composite primary keys. As an example, let's extend our comments with a timestamp. So the first thing we do is create a class called comment. We tell ODB that it's a, it's a composite value, and then we have a text and a timestamp, and then we just use it in a container. So pretty straightforward, I think. The other interesting kind of data member that we might want to use is a pointer to object. Pointers to object in, objects in RDB are used to represent relationships. Again, all the standard C++ 98 and 11 pointers are covered. The boost profile covers the its version of shared pointer and the Qt version, Qt profile covers the Qt shared pointer. It's also again, similar theme to containers. It's easy to add support for your own custom smart pointer and it'll work just like other ones. Okay, as an example, let's say we want to keep track who reported our bugs, right, as a reporter. So we add the user persistent object, nothing really interesting here. We use the email as an object ID and we have the first and last names. Once we have this other object, we can create a, we can add a shared point to it, to our bug report and call it a reporter. So this is an example of a unidirectional to one relationship. So we basically have a bug that is reported by a specific user. It could also be useful to know which bugs a user reported, right? So we can add a, a, a vector of pointers to bugs and call it the reported bugs. So in other words, we know which bugs were reported by the user. This is an example of a bidirectional many to one relationship. So the bug is reported by a single user while a user can report multiple bugs. Okay, we have a bit of a problem here. Anyone can tell me what it is? Right. So we have a, uh, an ownership cycle, right? We have a shared pointer and a shared pointer here. So we have a uh, ownership loop. Well, luckily we know how to fix it, right? Just use a weak pointer, easy stuff. Okay, we have another problem actually. This is the database schema that would be generated for this relationship. Anyone have any idea what the problem might be? Any database experts? Okay, the, the problem is we, we basically have two foreign keys for the same relationship. In, in C++, if we want, you know, we have two classes and we want to point to each other, we have to add a pointer in each one of them. But in the database, uh, a foreign key or a relationship can always be traversed in both directions. So this is actually redundant. So if you show this to your database administrator, he will scream at you and say, that's not the way to do it. And the way to fix this in ODB is to 
So actually, we actually need to tell ODB that one side, one point uh, in, in our relationship is actually an inverse or mirror side of the other. And we do it by, by saying that it's inverse and by specifying the other data member. Generally, it's a, always a good idea to make the container side inverse because then you just get rid of that whole mapping table. Okay, so we just tell ODB that the other side is inverse and everything is magically fixed and the DBA is now happy. This is just for those interested, a cute version of our relationship. Again, we're using cute data types, pointers and containers. We can also use relationships in queries. For example, we can look for all the bug reports that were reported by a user with a last name Do. And you can see here we use this. It basically looks just like plain C++. We even use the pointer dereference operator for, po for object pointers. Okay, let me mention quickly multi-database support. As I mentioned earlier, we can, th there are essentially two flavors. There is a stat static multi-database support and dynamic. With static, we pick a few specific databases and we use them uh, using perhaps their concrete interfaces. With the dynamic support, we work with, with, with the database using the common interface. And in fact, the, most of our code will probably not even know which database it's dealing with. Then there is also the mixed support. The idea is that sometimes using a dynamic support, you need to step down to the static support and do something really database specific. So in ODB, you can do that. To put it another way, the dynamic multi-database support is actually built on top of static. So anytime you actually need to do something database specific, you can always step down. To enable multi-database support, we use the dash M option, and then we specify the flavor. And you will also see this common database, which is kind of strange. Essentially, this is a common code that is shared by mapping code for all the specific databases. Now, if we look at what, what gets generated, then we'll see a bunch more files. I think everything is pretty clear. This is the common code and these are the database specific files. Let's take a, a the static um, multi-database support and here's an example. Let's say we, we have, we want to use SQLite as a local cache for, for our objects and then Postgres as a remote storage. So you, you saw SQLite is much faster because it's an embedded database. It's running in the same process as the application while Postgres is a remote client-server application. So here we created two database instances. We call one store and the other one is a cache. The store is Postgres database and cache is an SQLite database. First thing we do, we try to see if there is an object in the cache. If there is, then fine, great stuff. If there is none, then we actually have to go and check the store, which is probably quite a bit more expensive operation. This find function is the same like load, except instead of throwing an exception, if there's no object, it just returns a null point. Okay, the same logic implemented using dynamic multi-database support. Now we, uh, now we write common code that doesn't even know which database it's working with. So we have this function find bug. You can see we are using the common database interface. And again, we have our two stores, and then we just call this function first for the cache. If the object is not found, then we call it for the store. With dynamic support, you can actually package the, the database mapping code into separate DLLs or shared objects and load them at runtime if and when necessary. So this, this is basically an idea how that will look. And yeah, we have some tests of that and it works really well. So you can ship some extra database support for your applications separately if you want to. OK, 
Okay, database schema evolution. This is, uh, this, this stuff is quite interesting, I think. In fact, not many ORMs provide proper database schema evolution support, and I don't believe any other ORM in C++ or other languages implements anything that is similar to what ODB does. Schema evolution is a sensitive issue because normally there's production data involved. You, know, you have old data and now you changed your classes and but you still care about that data that is that that is stored in the database. As a result, the idea that we had with schema evolution is that we want to make simple, easy to understand building blocks that we can trust. In fact, my recommendation to people who are dealing with schema evolution support, if you if you see an evolution step from one version and in, to the other, and it's not immediately obvious that it that it's valid, then it's too complex. You know, if you need to think for a moment, does it do the right thing or not, then it's too complex already. Because trust me, this stuff can get really complicated very fast, and we'll see some examples of that. Schema evolution consists of two tasks: it's schema migra schema migration and data migration. Schema migration is essentially changes the database schema from, from the old format to the new one. So for example, we add or drop tables, add or drop columns, while data migration is actually converting the data from the old format to the new one. And by the way, there, you, you probably familiar heard of this noise scale databases and schemaless databases, and these people think that now that because they don't have a schema, they don't have a schema evolution problem, while in reality they just have a schema evolution problem in the whole new level. So, uh, not not having a formally defined schema doesn't mean that you don't have any of these issues. Okay, so let's say we want to enable schema evolution in ODB. To do that, we specify the version actually two versions. The first version is the base model version. It's, it's essentially the version, the earliest version from which we'll be able to migrate. I think the idea is pretty clear. You know, if you, you develop your application for five years, you don't want to care, carry all that migration code from version one. So you kind of want to specify the cutoff from where you can migrate. Well, the second version is the actual current version of your object model. So as an example, let's say we want to add another data member, uh, a platform, say, that the bug affects. So we increment the current version and we add the data member. Once this happens, well, once the ODB sees this version pragmas, it, it it essentially tells the ODB compiler that it now needs to keep track of, of changes to the, to the object model. And it does that using a change log. A change log is an XML file. Why, did, why is it XML file? Why did we decide to use XML? Well, the change log, while it's maintained automatically by the ODB compiler, it needs to be human readable. And it also would be nice to be able to write third party tools that analyze or merge or, or you know, re re review the change logs. So XML was actually a fairly natural choice in this case. A change log contains the base model, so basically the model from for the first version, as well as a change set for each version starting from the base. While the ODB compiler maintains the change log automatically, you would normally want to store to store it in, in a source code repository along with your, with your source files. So this is a bit of a kind of unusual thing because you know, ODB generates and maintains it, but you still want to store it in the source code repository. This is what a change log might look like for our uh, object model. So we have some base model that is not shown exactly, and then we have a change set for version two which seems to do the right thing. Well, it says what needs to be done, which is to alter table bug and add the column platform. So it looks kind of all right. Again, just to, to repeat, some people saw this XML 
nice looking XML and assume that they have to write it by hand. No, you don't need to write it by hand. ODB compiler maintains the change log, but you want you might want to review it and you would want to store it in the source code repository. Okay, once the once there is the change log, the ODB compiler then generates um, schema migration scripts for us. In fact, it generates two for each version, the pre-migration and the post-migration scripts. The idea is, and this is quite an interesting feature, the pre-migration script relaxes the schema so that the, both the data conforming to the old and the new version can coexist. During this step, we add new tables, new columns, and drop old constraints. The post-migration script tightens the schema back so that only the data conforming only the data conforming to the new version can exist in the database. So during this step, we drop the old tables, drop all columns, and we add the new constraints. So who can guess now where the data migration fits into this? Right. So it's in between the two. So you, I think the idea is pretty clear. We kind of we make make sure that we can store both old, but but the old data can remain in the database, and we can add new one. Then we convert the old to new, and then we execute the post migration step. We just make sure that the old data can no longer exist. Let's take a look at that. So this this is the pre migration step that was generated for our um, version two. Expect that things. The only thing that looks kind of strange is that the column is null while our, um, you know, we didn't ask the ODB compiler, we didn't say that our data member can be null. Well, the reason we do that is because there might be data in the database already, and if in, in, the, in the bug table already, and if we try to add a non-null column with a, in, to a table that already has data, that, that addition will fail because they obviously they base cannot figure out a new value for for our column for all the existing rows. So what ODB does, remember I told you it, it first it drops all constraints and it only adds the new constraints in the post. So what ODB does is it adds initially the column as null, so it then gives the chance that to the data migration code to assign some meaningful value to all the existing bug reports. And then in the post-migration step, it changes it back to not null. Okay, so let's take a look how we can implement the data migration. Here I'm using, again, I didn't mention that, but with, similar to schema creation, schema migration scripts, they can, you can either generate them as a standalone SQL files, or you can embed them into the C++ code. So here I'm using the embed, assuming that we embedded them into the C++ code, and I want to show how everything fits together. So first we call the pre-migration step to version two, then we load all the bugs, all the existing bugs, and the set platform to some meaningful value and store them back into the database. So now our, all the platform, all the new, all the values, all the rows in our database that have the platform column have some, the unknown value to it. And then we call the post migration script, which changes the column to not now as we've seen before. Rather than doing all this ourselves, we can rather register a data migration function for steps that require them, and then just do the whole thing and do the whole migration automatically with a single function call. So here's, here we are using uh, C++11 lambdas, very convenient for that. Specify the version and the lambda, which has exactly the same code that we've seen before. And now we do the data migrate, the whole schema in data migration with a single call. Let's take a look at another example. Briefly. Um, 
let's say we want to, you know, we, we store the username as two, two components, first and last name. Let's say we want to change it to, to a single, si single data member. Now, for some reason, we realize that, that that wasn't such a great idea. We'd rather store the name as a single column. So let's see how we can do that. Again, we increment the version number and we deleted the data members and we added a new one. Looks straightforward, right? This is the change, this is the, so we now run the ODB compiler on this and it updates the change log and now we go and we use diff or your better yet your favorite uh, source control tool. Normally you can review the changes. So we can see, okay, so this, this, is the, this is what got added. It's a change set for version three, changing the user table, added a column and dropped two. Looks good, right? Okay, now we are going to write a data migration function for this, for this step. And also again, fairly straightforward. Right, load all the bugs and combine the two name components and set it to the new name. Anyone see a problem with this line? Well, we have a much bigger problem, trust me. <laughs> it's actually, the, the funny thing is it's, it's so, the problem is so obvious that you know people don't realize it until they actually try to compile this this code. In fact, I haven't realized it until I actually tried to implement it and compile the example, and and then I saw it. So you see, so we what we do is we get the first name and the last name, and we assign it to the to the to the new name. But remember, we deleted the data members. We don't have first and last name, right? So in other words, you know, th th remember this, this code will write between the pre and post migration, uh, schema migration steps. So the data is actually in the database. We just don't have a data members in our persistent class to access them. So the question is how can we fix this? And yeah, I will finish the first half with that question and let you think about it and stew on it a bit. Thank you. Yeah, you have questions. Yeah, it does. I'm actually going to talk about that in the second half. Okay. Yes, I have a question. Okay, so okay, I, the question is: uh, Is ODB compiler able to handle non-standard C++? For example, maybe there's some some headers included that use uh, that use um, compiler extensions, and the answer is not out of the box. So, in other words, if you try to compile something like this, it will fail. But what it's, it's fairly easy to work around that. As you might have seen at the beginning, there was an if diff ODB compiler. So there is actually, when, when you compile uh, your source code, your header file with the ODB compiler, it defines this ODB compiler ma macro. So as long as you don't use um, non-standard C++ extensions in your persistent classes, you can always kind of disable those special includes just for the ODB compiler. So it's all, it's, it's doable. Question? Yeah, do you have uh, query uh, functions uh, defined like take first, take end? Well, I want the, you know, the uh, maximum. Mm. Okay, uh, the question is, is there support for, uh, I think it, the, the common term is pagination for this. So basically, is it possible to get the first 10 elements of the, uh, of the result and then 
maybe next. You know, there's usually a, a, an offset and a limit to the query. The answer is, th this stuff is actually database specific and not all of them supported. So there's no built-in support. There's no nice function like limit in ODB. But remember I showed you, you can always, you, you, essentially with ODB you can always drop down to native SQL and, and just, you know, add whatever database specific stuff you want. So it, it's, it's if, if the database that you are using supports it, like for example, Postgres, it has offset and limit, you just add, you know, offset and you, and you can specify how many very, uh, return and limit how many returns. So it's, it's doable. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's pretty easy to do. Question? Update queries. Okay, so the question and a comment was that if we if there was an ability to kind of update objects in place in the database rather than you know loading them into C, you know and doing some manipulation and storing them, then that would be possible. And the answer is, yeah, well, two answers. First of all, there is no, what we, we call this a mass update. So basically you update a whole bunch of objects in the database. This is not yet supported, but there is a plan for it. So this will be probably in the next version or two. But the problem with a suggested approach, yes, it will work in this case. But what, what if we need to implement a more complex logic? You know, so you're basically saying, okay, I cannot do data migration in C++. I always have to do it in the, in the database. And you know, some of them, for some of them, you might want to do it that way. But generally, you know, we can, we as in ODB developers, we cannot always assume that you will be able to implement a data migration inside the database. Because I mean, the Lord, like for example, um, SQLite doesn't have stored procedures or anything like that. So, you know, the, the, the things that you can do in, inside the database are pretty limited. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I think we are done then. But there is, there is a solution for that. So, you can come in about 20 minutes and learn about it. Thank you.